morning and good afternoon to in-house counsel from all across America. Welcome to In-House Connect. My name is Shai Mahani, and I am the CEO and co-founder of In-House Connect, and I'm thrilled to have you here with us today. Thank you for spending your breakfast time or your lunch time with us, and special thanks to our wonderful sponsor, Legal Tech Hub, and our fantastic presenters today, Nikki Shaver and Yaroon Plink for putting together a fantastic presentation on legal tech essentials for in-house counsel. For those of you who are here for the first time, let me give you a quick bit of background on In-House Connect. In-House Connect started over 11 years ago as a New York City-based meetup group for in-house counsel. Every month, In-House Connect would organize free CLE classes, which were hosted by different law firms, which were then followed by cocktail networking receptions. And every six months, we would organize fun and festive networking mixers. Over the years, in-house connect has helped thousands of in-house counsel connect with peers and outside counsel alike. The group was humming along, and then, of course, COVID hit. We couldn't meet in person, so we met online, which has been a fantastic transition. We've been able to attract, attract a much larger audience of in-house counsel from coast to coast. And we've been able to facilitate way more networking and relationship building. And we've been able to feature high caliber speakers like the two we have today, who I'm going to introduce in just a few moments. Before I do that, this is our 42nd event of the year thus far. And I'm wondering, are you here for the first time or have you attended an IHC event before? So it looks like we have a 80-20 split, um, and that is 80% returning, 20% new visitors, or new viewers, I should say. So welcome to the 20%, and welcome back to the 82%. It's wonderful to have you with us. All right, no more housekeeping announcements. Let's get to today's event. Legal Tech Essentials for In-House Counsel, Key Basics for Selecting the Right Legal Tech Solutions for Your Legal Department. Our panelists today, our first panelist is Nikki Shaver. Nikki is the CEO and co-founder of Legal Tech Hub, a Legal Te Tech Hub, not Legal Tech Hub, although I'm sure that would be a great company, um, Legal Tech Hub, a resource supporting informed procurement of legal technology by commercial legal organizations, recently serving as the Global Managing Director of Innovation and Knowledge at Paul Hastings. Nikki has over 20 years of experience in the legal industry, many of which have been spent driving culture change in law firms and innovation in legal service delivery. Named ILTA's Innovative Leader of the Year in 2020, Nick, uh, Nikki was also honored in, 20, in the 2021 Fast Case 50 list. Nikki is also an adjunct professor at Cardozo Law, teaching legal technology, and is a frequent advisor to law firms, corporate legal departments, and legal technology vendors. We are very lucky to have Nikki with us today. And as well, we're very fortunate to have Yarun on as well. Yarun is the Yarun Plink is the COO and co-founder of Legal Tech Hub. Yarun has been in legal tech since the early 2000s, having started his career as a lawyer for Clifford Chance. He founded two legal tech companies and established practical law in the USA for from zero to 80% of the AMLAW 200, um, as well as thousands of other law firms and in-house legal departments. Yarun worked as an innovator at Clifford Chance, advised and invested in many legal tech companies, including Kira, Leopard Solutions, and Case Text. He spent most of his career selling legal tech products and acknowledges that getting eyeballs on products and services is a major challenge in the legal industry, which is why we organize these fantastic events. Uh, we are really lucky to have two, uh, you know, titans of the legal tech world with us on. And, you know, I really mean that. So I will turn it over to Nikki and Yarun to, to, to get us started. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Shai. I think we, we can skip over this page because Shai has given such a lovely introduction to both of us. So today we are going to be talking about solving business problems. I think the ad initially talked about solving legal technology problems and introducing legal technology, but really what we want to talk about is a little bit broader than that. I'm going to hand over to Yarun for the first part of our presentation. Um, the first topic, and that's it is one of the major topics, is I've identify where to start what are the initiatives that you want to um, apply technology to to solve those problems um, or or find alternative solutions than technology but it's 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 about identifying the right initiatives then how do you prioritize those initiatives i mean if you're in a in a legal in most legal departments you have a long list of potential challenges you can attack varying from contracting to uh, contract management to litigation management um, and so uh, we'll, we'll help you with a few frameworks for priority setting. Then 
how do you sort of find um, the relevant solutions um, for the, the problems that you want to um, solve? And then finally, change management and adoption. How do you ensure that um, when you've bought a, a solution or introduced a solution on the basis of the already existing technology or processes that people actually use the solution and make sure that um, you get an ROI out of your investment. And then finally, um, if we have time, we can finish with Q&A. So over to um, uh, the introductory part, Nikki, if you can switch to slide five. Um, um, so our core mission is to provide guidance to um, legal and legal is in, in the broadest sense of the word, so it's law firms and in-house counsel, um, and we we feel that that mar that guidance is needed because the technology and the alternative legal services space and consulting to legal is very intransparent. Um, uh, what we're seeing is that the, the the status quo for for how things are being done is no longer acceptable, whereas. 10 years ago or even or even five years ago you could get away with the same technologies and solutions that you were using 25 years ago that no longer works um, COVID has contributed to that but uh, there's also the the long-standing increasing number of regulations and number of documents are generated for the legal department that create a need for for new processes new technologies um, to help you get through those processes and and and, and, and workflow um, easier the, the 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 needs and the, the desires of the workforce are are, are changing um, i am uh, i started when in an era when Innovation meant uh, changing um, uh, ashtrays for uh, for monitors, um, uh, but the newer class of people that are coming in are in fact um, they they grown up with with technology and they expect technology to help them in their in their daily um, work. Um, then the, the other trend that we're seeing is that technology is maturing. Uh, whereas even five years ago, a company I was involved with, Kira Systems, um, was considered novel. Um, the, that kind of technology at the moment is 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 mainstream. Um, it, it still needs. Uh, uh, a few last steps, but um, it's getting more and more mature and it's actually helping in in-house departments and law firms solve real life problems. And then the, 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 the final thing is that um, as other service providers beyond legal are seeing, uh, are providing um, more up-to-date and more modern uh, solutions, the clients are um, are seeing what is good um, uh, from those other providers and expect the same level of quality and technology from their legal departments and, and law firms. So that's the that's the, the the environment in which we find ourselves. But the challenge is that most law law firms and law departments don't really know where to start on their uh, digital transformation journey. Do you attack your contracting problems first? Do you attack your contract management first? Do you work on legal hold? Um, and once you've identified that challenge, how do you solve that challenge? And how in, in, a, in a sea of solutions, do you select the solution? Um, that is right for you. Um, a, a good case study. Uh, we were, I, would talk, I was talking to the head of legal operation of a major company on the West Coast uh, the other day. They did a RFP process for 34 different CLM providers um, to, in order to choose one. Uh, that's an expensive and lengthy process and we're trying to help in-house departments 
cut through that uh, selection process a lot faster. And then on the flip side, the um, uh, where we where, where, where our primary uh, focus is on helping the buyers um, identify software, our secondary focus is on helping vendors identify the right buyers. Um, uh, the market is still mature, the vendors are immature, uh, the vendors um, are really good at, um, uh, or some of them are really good at developing solutions that solve actual problems, but how do you get in front of the right audience? How do you make sure that um, uh, that message gets across? So we can, so we are, that's, th those are our core two uh, focus points. Um, and then you can go to the, the next slide. Um, so we're doing that in a number of different ways. Um, first of all, first of all, and this is what we launched with in 2020, is our directory, um, a comprehensive directory of listing of, of solutions to legal problems, uh, business problems that are solved partially by technology and partially by um, alternative legal service providers or um, or consultants. Um, uh, we 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 allow buyers to sift through. Um, hundreds of different solutions. So we're looking at a screen on the top right hand side of document automation solutions. There's 126 solutions that say a fairly large field, but with sophisticated filters, we help you uh, select the tool or your short list of tools that is right for you. Um, can you go to the next slide, please? Um, our, uh, our our second part that we're focusing on is insights and analysis. Um, we've established a team of key experts on various topics. So, for example, Lucy Basley, who will be speaking in two days in in Ask Connect, is our expert on CLM. Um, for a topic like that, we develop. Um, a series of resources, a landscape article that um, um, explains what the landscape is on uh, on CLM. What's the technology used for? How do you? Um, uh, what, 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 where's the uh, technology trending? Who's using what? Who are all the providers in the space? Um, and then we give practical tools, um, a set of functional requirements. If you're starting out and uh, on your first in your journey to buying a you, your first CLM or you're replacing an existing CLM, you need a list of functional requirements. You need a set of evaluation criteria. You need to know what others are doing and you need some in-depth information about the technology solution. So that will all be part of our insights and analysis piece. And alongside that, we have resources that help um, uh, in-house departments and law firms on their digital transformation journey. Where do you start? Uh, what's the typical tax stack for a 30 people in house department. Uh, what does that look like? Um, and what are others doing in the space? The, so that's our, our second uh, uh, leg of the, the stool. The, and then the third is legal tech jobs. Um, this is a job site that focuses exclusively on jobs in the legal tech and legal ops space. Um, uh, the companies or in-house legal departments can post jobs for a relatively uh, low fee. And then finally, uh, we do a lot of consulting. Um, and our consulting varies, or we've got three different audiences, um, vendors um, who we help with, making sure that they have the right uh, solution to a problem that people are actually seeking to solve, and we help them with selling. Um, and, and then law firms and in-house departments, we help with their digital transformation journey, with vendor selection, with um, uh, innovation strategy um, and, and a number of other things. Um, 
so that's the um, uh, that's the the, the small uh, commercial bit and um, most of the, the the remainder of the presentation will be delivered by nikki as she is the absolute number one expert on uh, selection and um, identifying um, and, 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 and I, identifying problems and uh, solutions um so um, i'll hand over to nikki for the next part thank you Yurin. all right so um a number of you perhaps were at our last presentation uh, which i mentioned at the intro that presentation was an initial initial offering on digital transformation and really how to get started and how to think about digital transformation. And I mentioned that because in, ef in effect, this is part two of that, though you don't have to have attended part one in order to get the sense of the current presentation. And by way of background, as Shai mentioned, I was the managing director of innovation and knowledge at Paul Hastings prior to jumping on board with Legal Tech Hub full time. Um, and before that, I used to do additional innovation leadership at other firms. And as part of my job, I have done a very deep dive into the most effective frameworks and models for really driving change across an organization. And during our last presentation, we went to you and asked you, what was most important to you and how many of you were mandated with or associated with digital transformation efforts within your companies. And many of you expressed that you were either leading or expected to drive some portion of those digital transformation efforts or that you were at the least affiliated. And I've seen in the participant list, some of you are GCs, welcome others in-house counsel and we have some legal ops folk as well. So I, I think, this will be relevant to all of you and all of you will be able to take some element of this away. I will say uh, we have 40 minutes to get through a large number of slides. So I do apologize for that, but we will be providing you with the slides, I think through Shai afterwards. So if I need to rush, hopefully you'll be able to dig deep at a later stage. So during our first presentation, we spoke to you about what we call the 3D model for digital transformation, which really looks at the different core parts of the business that you're involved with as legal counsel or GCs or um, as part of the legal operations team. And that is looking at business operations and the way that the business runs. So processes, efficiency, productivity within the business, especially those parts of the business that are related to legal. Legal operations, so the performance of your team, and outside council management. And when you're looking at initiatives and really where to dig in and get started with a digital transformation mandate or understanding what projects you or your team can undertake that will have the most impact on the organization as a whole or on your team, some of the things that you will be looking for as strategic partners to the business, which is really how GCs have trended. Um, all of you will have felt this in your roles and read about it, that the role of the GC has really transformed to become not just legal counsel to the business, but really a strategic partner to the business. And as such, you are looking for goals, initiatives that allow you to produce efficiency and productivity gains um, within your team or within the business that allow you to streamline processes to eliminate waste, that bring consistency to processes that have previously been messy or chaotic. Um, of course, what you want is a high functioning legal team. You want to get the most value possible from your budget, not necessarily to reduce it, but to make sure that you are eking it for every penny and you want quality and transparency from outside counsel. If there are any other goals that you see as being key strategic goals for yourself that have some tie-in to digital transformation, please drop them into the chat. We'd love to see. And now, by the way, when we talked about the 3D model for digital transformation during our last session, we also asked you which of those three areas was most important to you right now. And overwhelmingly, the majority of you said the operation of the legal team itself was what you were most focused on at the moment in order to really drive productive um, projects through the business as a whole, you need to have a legal team that is high functioning. Um, so that's something that I mentioned simply because for those of you who were not 
present at that session, um, it may be interesting and I'm curious as well to know whether you feel the same way. So a number of the initiatives that will often be identified within businesses for corporate legal to tackle as part of digital transformation are those that you see on the screen. Um, of course, anything that falls within contracting and there are all kinds of processes within your business um, around contracting that you may be able to dig into in order to improve the way that contracts are managed across the organization. Managing outside council relationships and very much tied to that is managing data. Um, data for the way that you are servicing the business, but also data on the performance of outside counsel. Um, and I know many of you will be focused on how can you get your arms around the data and really represent it in a way that allows you to clearly and transparently show to your business what's happening, um, how are people performing, how, how effective um, is the work being done in the department. Managing resources effectively is another pocket, managing performance, um, and then the legal work itself. So litigation, um, deal work, also document production. Many of you previously have cited a genuine interest in document management and knowledge management, the ability to quickly find content and information that allows you to do your jobs better. Um, also signing limits, um, understanding and ensuring that signing limits for contracts are clear across the business, managing approvals and e-signatures. So where do you start? In order to develop a list of initiatives that you might see as your effective roadmap for digital transformation. First of all, speak to your stakeholders. It sounds obvious, but it's so easy to forget that speaking regularly to the people you work with to understand how is their work going? Where are their problems in that work? Um, where are their pain points? Are there areas of repetitive manual work that they should not be undertaking that are excellent options for automation? Where are the workflows that are most tied to key strategic objectives of the business or of your team, wherever you're focusing most? Um, look for areas where there is waste in resources or in budget. Um, internal bottlenecks. So where, where are there areas of the business where a project might start somewhere and then when it gets to that department, for example, it just dies or it stalls? Um, and similarly, that's really on the human side, but where, where is money just falling down the drain? All of these are areas or pockets of the business or of your team where you can go to to really start uncovering the needs that should be addressed by your roadmap. And once you've identified those needs, think about starting by, for example, splitting up the work that your team does into the different areas that we've identified for digital transformation. What is the work that is done that is focused on the business operation? What is the work that is done that is very much about the way that the legal department operates? What is the work that is done in relation to outside counsel management? Where is your team spending the most time? What is the type of work within those areas that is most important to your goals as GC or your goals on the operational side? And similarly, look at the strategic objectives of the business as, as a whole. What is the work that your team is doing that is most tied to those business goals? So the first framework I'm going to introduce to you might be familiar to some of you, but really what it focuses on is before jumping into finding a solution to a problem, understanding, making sure that you have fully understood the problem, um, which sounds like it should be obvious, but it very commonly is not. So this is a creative problem solving methodology called design thinking. And it's really focused on five key elements, um, empathize, define, ideate, prototype, and test. The idea with empathy is that you do research, you speak to the people who experience this particular problem to understand what their needs are in relation to it. By taking those needs, you define the problem. What is it precisely in that problem space that you are looking to solve? Then you go out and actually search for solutions. So this is where 
you go wide, you involve stakeholders across the business and really think about how you might creatively solve this problem. Then you generate what we would call perhaps a minimum viable product or a prototype of a solution that comes some way towards addressing the problem. And then you tweak it and you test it and you constantly go back to the people who experience that problem to make sure that what you have is on the right track and moving towards a solution. And by the way, that design thinking, sometimes people think looks a little bit hokey because it has that element of empathy, which is really foreign to the way that lawyers think. So whenever I introduce design thinking within a law firm, uh, you know, a lot of lawyers lawyers think, oh my goodness, what are we talking about here? We're talking about emotions and feelings when we talk about empathy. But in fact, design thinking also is very similar. It's analogous to the scientific meth method. Um, you identify a problem, then you dig into it by conducting research, then you ideate by developing a hypothesis, which really is an idea. Then you experiment. So you create a prototype and test your hypothesis and you come back and you come back and you eventually reach a conclusion. That's really what we're talking about is solving problems using effectively the scientific method. But we call it design thinking when we're looking at it as a human centered process. And the reason that this is important is um, it provides a structured process that you can actually use in a practical environment to innovate new solutions. Um, and it, it creates a solution that really sits within that sweet spot of what your people want. So if you're solving a problem for your team, for example, the user, um, which is how design thinking often refers to the person who sits at the core of the problem um, will be the people on your team. If it's the business, they might be stakeholders across the rest of the, of the business. But you're bringing together what is desirable for those people, what is feasible from a technological perspective, but also from a resource perspective, and what is economically viable. So you're making sure that the solution you find is one that is actually practically possible within your environment. Um, and this is a process that has been widely applied um, and it really moves, it shifts from making you think I'm going to create a solution and then I'm going to go to people and say, you should do this process in a different way. Instead, what you're doing is going to the people first, understanding how they would like to work, what they would like, and then going to solve the problem. Generally speaking, this helps to solve a problem more effectively. Um, and that is borne out practically by the results. So McKinsey year after year has shown that design-led companies significantly outperform non-design-led companies uh, when it comes to profitability. Um, and the logos you see on the screen are really only a handful of the companies that use design thinking for their business. Uh, most product, most companies, in fact, probably many of the companies that you work for will be using design thinking in some aspect of the company, but potentially not yet for internal processes. And that is where you can come in and really have a significant impact. So with design thinking, what you do once you've identified your list of problems, you dig deeper into the problem before you jump to solving it. You really become clear about what the problem is at its core. What are the needs that people have in relation to the problem? One of the things to recognize in relation to this is when you're speaking to people about how they experience a problem within their work, for example, what they will often say to you about what the problem is or what outcome they're looking for is very unlikely to be the thing that actually sits at the core of the problem, which is really difficult. You have to keep probing in order to get there. Um, an example of this is at Paul Hastings, a partner had come to our team and said what they wanted was a better data visualization of their team's resourcing. And of course, once we spoke to him, we understood that what he really wanted was something much more, much more complex, and it was much more tied to matters than it was to capacity. But we would not have understood that had we just left to start solutionizing without understanding the problem. And so this is a framework that is often applied 
within organizations when they're looking to solve a problem. Um, when you're speaking to people, interrogate them and ask questions and ask them to put their request within this framework. When I, such and such, the situation, the process they're undertaking, I want to, which refers to their motivation in undertaking that process so that I can, and that goes to their expected outcome. And an example here, um, a number of examples of why this framework works and why it's important to speak to people and dig a little bit deeper um, is the problem that I call a better lawnmower. If someone comes to you and says, I need a better lawnmower, and you rush to the store to buy a lawnmower that is faster and more powerful and perhaps top of the line and expensive, you may come back and find it actually does not suit this person at all. Perhaps they have mobility issues. Perhaps they have an intricate garden that requires them to get into nooks and crannies. Um, and in fact, what you'll find is they don't need a lawnmower. What they need is for their grass to be neat and tidy. And there may be other ways of doing that. A very common example here is people don't actually want to drill, they want a hole in their wall. Um, another one is if someone comes to you and says, I'm looking for, you know, I want our school buses to be updated so that they are better and more modern. Really what they want is a safer way to transport their children to school. And if you translate that into the organizational um, situation, this is a good example of that. Someone might come to you and say, our intranet is terrible. We need a new intranet. You know, our the site we use to manage work for our legal team is awful. We need to redesign it. When you dig into it, the situation is when the website is awful, I want to redesign it. But why? So I can convert more leads, for example. For your, for your team, that might be so that I can better handle my work so I can manage my tasks and workload. And then it makes me feel that I'm doing my work effectively. I'm confident about my work and I can show others that I am driving the company forward and doing my work. Um, so this is a nice way of sort of breaking down a problem to get to really what is the core. All right, so once you have a list of problems and you've dug into those problems to really understand what sits at the core of them, you move towards setting priorities. And this is key because this is really where you're getting into what is your roadmap for innovation for digital transformation. So looking first at timelines, McKinsey in 2020 introduced a theory that they called the Three Horizons Theory. And this is a theory that really allows for organizations to create innovation both in current state and in future state. So every one of the three horizons describes a different level of risk of projects and provides a way to um, evaluate projects, segment projects, and manage a portfolio in a way that will support both current and future growth. So this is what that looks like. Um, horizon one projects extend the core of the business. Horizon two projects develop some new opportunities that are adjacent to that initial core business. And horizon three um, projects create brand new viable options. Um, so if you are defining your own goals, Think about what does the business want you to be? Did they hire you to be an operator, a business builder, or a visionary? And where do you see your role within that business? The projects you take on will likely be informed by your answers to those questions. And by the way, there's nothing wrong with being an operator as opposed to a visionary. That may very well be exactly where the business needs you to sit. The other model that is useful when you're segmenting projects is Clayton Christensen's model of sustaining versus disruptive innovation. So this is often intersected with the three horizons model to talk about innovations that are within the existing business model of a business. Um, they create incremental growth and, and then disruptive projects that really take the business on a new path. And the most successful businesses are those that plan for both. I would suggest that the most successful legal departments are likely going to be those that similarly plan for both. And so think about, again, as someone who is a key strategic 
uh, individual within the business, are you part of disruptive innovation and growth as a stakeholder only, or are you expected to drive disruptive innovation and growth? And if so, what does that mean? So sustaining innovation are those that uh, improve existing products. Um, there are generally year-to-year -year improvements, uh, incremental improvements. They can also be technologically complex projects. Generally speaking, it is about improving performance, but again, within the existing business model, within existing market needs or business needs. Disruptive innovation, by contrast, creates brand new markets potentially um, and solves problems in a new way or solves completely new problems. And it, the interesting thing about disruptive innovation is because this is brand new, it can take some time to get off the ground. So you will see fewer quick wins initially, but you will then see much greater and faster improvement in the long term. Um, another way of looking at this for those of you who have some background in business is red ocean, blue ocean, where blue ocean is an ocean or a part of the market that has been completely untapped. So you're not necessarily subject to competition in the market. Red ocean is the way you've always done things and there is high competition in the market. So if you are only focusing as a business on sustaining innovation, what that might mean is that you have nothing that you're working on currently that allows you to get to the space as a business that puts you completely out of, of the realm of what your competitors are doing because you found something brand new. And as you can see, the pace of change is different depending on whether you're focused on sustaining innovation or disruptive innovation. So uh, sustaining innovation, you see results faster. Disruptive innovation, the, the curve or the, the line of improvement is steeper. So ranking priorities, getting back to the practical and the list of projects you would now have developed as part of your roadmap. Think about the value of each of those projects. Um, what type of value does it bring? Is it, is it useful as a project because it brings financial benefits? So for example, does it impact the way that you use your budget as a team? Um, does it impact the way that your budget is leveraged for the business? Does it improve efficiency and productivity? Um, does it further a strategic objective for your team or for the business as a whole? Um, and looking at those, which of those values is most important to you as a leader um, or to the business as a whole. Also look at what is the level of effort that is involved for each project. And of course, that includes the amount of time it will take, as well as the number of resources that will have to be leveraged on that project when they're already very busy also doing legal work. What are the budgetary constraints you have available for the project? Um, and one of the key things is, how important actually is the problem to your stakeholders? You may have a list of projects and some of them might seem like high value, but when you speak to the people who are experiencing that problem, they don't really consider it to be terribly urgent compared to another problem. Um, this is a matrix that I find incredibly helpful when you're looking at a list of projects to determine which of them you should move forward. So you can see impact or value, is on the vertical line and effort is on the horizontal line. And so those projects that are lower in effort but higher in impact are obviously going to have, have the best return on investment for your team. Um, so the way you would use this is you'd look at low hanging fruit, low effort, high value or impact. Those are really the project to focus on now. And you can actually create a list of projects and a timeline, a roadmap based on this prioritization matrix and the work you've already done on determining value. You can use success for these low hanging fruit projects to generate momentum for other projects. Low effort, low impact, a lot of people would say forget about those projects, but it's important to understand why is the impact low. If it's low because there's not great value from a business perspective, then you shouldn't really approach those projects at all. But if it's low because it only affects a small part of that business, but in fact, it tremendously impacts that small part of the business. Well, if that small part of the business is important, perhaps they're worth engaging in these projects. Um, and then the high effort, high impact projects. These are ones where you may not have the bandwidth or the buy-in to do them now, but once you do have support, 
these will be important to tackle. So moving on now to finally, we've dug into the problem, you've created a roadmap, you've prioritized, now you're driving towards a solution. So you're choosing the project that you're really going to move forwards, you've dug into it, you've truly understand, understood it, you move to develop a project or a change team. Um, so you're identifying here all of the relevant stakeholders who are the most critical to this project. What are the resources you will need for your project team? What skills do you need on that team? Um, note that for most of these projects, you will need skills that may fall without outside of your legal team. So where will you go to find those people? Um, you may need to assign a project manager from somewhere else within the business. Once you have your core change team, you can move towards ideation and defining the solution. So looking at, is this a people problem, a process problem, or a technology problem? And one of the reasons that we changed the title of this presentation is because many of the core business problems that you will have to address within your roles are not just technology problems, or perhaps they're not technology problems at all. Perhaps the, the difficulty when you dig into it is that the process or the way that the technology has been configured is wrong. Look at the existing process, understand what works about it, what doesn't, and take the time before you really start the project to measure different aspects of the existing workflow. How long does it take to perform this workflow before you fix the process or apply the technology? That information, gathering that now, will stand you in very good stead later. If it is a problem that includes technology, is there an existing product in place? If so, look at it. Have there been complaints made about it? Um, if you have a help desk, an IT help desk within the business, go to the help desk, identify what tickets have been opened in relation to this product. Um, speak to the stakeholders about it to understand what they find good and bad about it. This will help you when you start ideating and thinking about what a new, a new solution might look like. And then actually hold an ideation session with your stakeholders. So this is core again to the design thinking process is working with your stakeholders to come up with ideas rather than assuming that a particular solution is better. Work with your stakeholders, lay down some rules about how the ideation will work and get everyone to generate ideas around a solution and then to communicate those and test those with each other. By testing at this stage, really what I mean is question each other. Um, is this likely to work or not? It has been proven again and again that teams that do ideation as a group rather than one person, for example, are much more likely to achieve a correct or functional solution. Um, similarly, those teams that do this when they have diversity, um, including people from all of the different departments are much more likely to come up with a solution that works for the entire business if what you're looking at is a business problem. If what you're looking at is a legal department problem, make sure that you include people from all different parts of your department. And so really explore the question, um, have people break the ideas into themes, amplify the good ideas that are able to be to survive the questioning um, and analysis. And then ultimately you'll come to a solution that looks like it's going to be a good fit for the problem and you can move forward to develop requirements. Requirements are really critical before you go to market and look for a solution. If you do not develop requirements, and you do not make sure that you understand the problem properly and that you've brought all of the stakeholders to the table when you're ideating, you're unlikely to introduce to the business a solution, whether that's a technology solution or a process solution that will really fit in your environment and solve the problem. So a, a requirement is simply a way of recording needs and what you will need from the solution. But there are many different types of of requirements. So business requirements are those high level requirements that really express the desired outcomes. Functional solution requirements are not necessarily technical, but they provide the definition of what the solution will do or should, should do. Content requirements, is there 
information? Is there legal material that has to funnel through the solution? What is that content? Do you need taxonomies? Do you need content from different parts of the business? What are the stakeholder requirements? So from each, if you're working on a multi-departmental project, what are the requirements that each of the different stakeholder departments have? If you're looking at just the legal department, all of the different people on the team, what are their needs in relation to this? Then non-functional requirements, you might be looking at what's the required response time, for example, or what is the availability of customer service? Transition requirements, what's the level of effort and how long will it take and what's involved in moving from an old system to a new system? And system requirements are the technical requirements really. And so developing requirements will require you to sit with your team, your project team, and really work through understanding what those requirements are by speaking to all of the different people at a strategic level and a business level. But one thing I want to note when Yarun at the beginning of this presentation spoke about the insights and analysis platform that Legal Tech Hub is launching later this year, we are actually going to develop sets of requirements for different types of business projects. So that rather than having to start from scratch when you're developing requirements, you'll be able to come to Legal Tech Hub and say, well, I'm looking at CLM and download a set of requirements for CLM, for a CLM platform, for example, or a document management platform. And then all you have to do is tweak it to suit your environment rather than starting from scratch in this process. And, you know, if you're looking at a process solution, you're going to want to map it and then improve it. One way to do this is also to identify bright spots, people who are undertaking the work in a way that is more effective than others, and then distribute those to other people. For people, think about are the right people performing this process? Is there a better resource that could be undertaking this work? Or, or maybe there are too many people involved. When you map out the solution, you notice that this contract touches that person and that person and that person and that person, but actually it could go from here to here without losing a lot. Note that with technology problems, a technology problem doesn't necessarily mean you need new technology. And also there's absolutely no point in introducing new technology until you've looked at the underlying process and made sure to refine it and improve it. Otherwise what you're doing with technology is speeding up a poor process rather than actually adding any value. If you do have a technology project, um, what you want to do is look at the existing systems. You may not have to go to market. There might be a system that is in use in a different part of the business that you were previously unaware of that could actually be leveraged to solve your problem. Also, there are potentially creative ways to use technology solutions that people think of, of doing as doing one thing. An example of that is JIRA, which is a project management solution that is usually used just for the IT department. But if what you need is project management solution to support your team, there might be a way of leveraging JIRA in a way that makes it accessible to your team. There's also the possibility that you could pin together different solutions at the firm, at the business in order to create a solution that works. Um, so look at what you have first and only then go to market. When you do go to market, this is a model that is very useful. Think about, do you, is there something available that you can buy off the shelf that will solve your problem? Is there something that, um, if not, are you able to partner with a vendor in the industry to create the type of solution that you're looking for? Um, and really, you would only move to build something yourself internally, unless there was a huge strategic advantage to be had from doing so. One of the places you can go when you are looking for solutions, of course, is Legal Tech Hub. Um, note, however, that depending on what area of the business you're looking at a problem, you may not be looking for legal tech specifically. So there are other directories on the market, such as G2 and Captera. And then once you've found a list of solutions that may be appropriate, you're going to want to have an evaluation framework that allows you to ask the right questions of vendors as you're reviewing demos. You also will want to use your detailed requirements to make sure that when you're reviewing solutions, you're making sure that they fit exactly for your environment and for your problem. The CLM system that you use ultimately that works for you may be very different to the CLM system that works 
fantastically well for another business. So going to other businesses to find out what they use um, and what they find is effective is useful, but only so far. You really don't want to rely on that exclusively as your reason to bring in technology. What you want to do is make sure that for your specific problems and for your environment, you're bringing on the right solution. And for that reason as well, you should always consider running a pilot or a proof of concept to validate the solution and its relevance to your project before you implement. And then you're going to want to involve your end users at every stage of this process. So if you're working with your team, get a number of the lawyers on your team to look at the demos, to be involved in the pilot. It is a resource drain, but having them involved makes a very big difference to change management down the track, which brings us to change management. So a solution that you bring on board does not solve any problem unless it's used. Uh, and that means that the project leader, whether that's you or someone on your team or someone in the business, part of their responsibility and the responsibility of the project team is to shepherd users through the change process in order to drive adoption. And so there are a number of change management philosophies. This Cotter, John Cotter, is sort of the godfather or grandfather of change management. And he had a system of eight steps for ensuring that you successfully drive change across an organization. And so step one is building a vision, understand what you're looking for. What's the solution going to look for? What do you want for change? Educate and build awareness across the business or your team, depending on where the project is located, to let them know this is our vision, this is critical for these reasons, here's the benefit it will bring. You're going to want to build support, change agents, and that means of course, you want to have buy-in from the top of the business. You also want to have people in different departments or across your department who are huge supporters. Generating that initial change team and understanding your stakeholders from the beginning and involving end users in, in the project from the beginning is one of the ways to do that. One great thing you can do, which is quite simple, is to develop an elevator pitch for the project that very clearly and succinctly enunciates why you're doing this, what the value is, and making sure that every single person involved in the project knows that elevator pitch off by heart. So if they are in an elevator with someone, they can use it. This is the change curve. So everyone in the organization or in your department will go through an emotional roller coaster when it comes to change. The brain, cha the brain processes change as fear or pain, so they will go through an emotional response. So what can you do about that? So these are steps four to six, sorry, you execute on the project and communicate quick wins along the way, which gets buy-in from people and helps to generate additional change agents. And finally, what you want is to lock in the change. So you actually need to get to the point where the new process and the new technology feels like it's normal. People forget that they used to do things in a different way. And one of the ways to do that is connect old workflows to the new workflow and communicate to people where in their work processes they use the new thing or the new process. And to overcome resistance, there will be some saboteurs who um, resist what you're doing, they may never change. So your job is to understand and identify them, restrict their impact on the rest of the business, but then provide support to those who are responding emotionally, but also direction. So training, education, white glove support as far as you can. And finally, repeat your vision as often as possible so people recognize what the goal is ultimately. For key takeaways in our remaining moment, you really have an opportunity. So by doing the work to uncover the various initiatives that will drive digital transformation, either within your team or across the business, and by leveraging frameworks and models to create a roadmap, you'll be able to do something that's useful to the whole business. And really consider what the work has needs to be done that will prepare the business or your team to take on those challenges, but then leverage your change team and stakeholders and make sure that some of this work is distributed. And by utilizing established models, such as the ones that we've covered today, and also by testing and tweaking your solution so that 
you make sure with end users that you're bringing something on board that really meets their expectations and needs, you're going to have a successful project because you'll ensure you have adoption and buy-in. And by doing this as a GC or as the head of operations, you can really put yourself in the driving seat for positive change across your team, but also potentially across the broader organization, which is really what most GCs now are being called upon to do. So that's it. We made it right on time. <laughs> no, I, unfortunately, Shai, very little time for Q&A, if any. First of all, I just want to thank you, Nikki, for delivering a fantastic presentation. There was a lot of great information there, a lot of wonderful insights. So thank you. And of course, thank you to Yarun as well. We had one question pre, you know, that was submitted by the registrants. It's a little bit of a specific question, but I'll, but I'll ask it. It is, are you aware of, and if so, do you follow any of the guidance of the OSPO initiatives, the Linux, Linux Foundation's TODO group or OW2 Good Governance Initiative. Are you familiar with those and, and do you follow any of those guidelines? I am not. If you send that through to us afterwards, Shai, with, with the various acronyms, I think that will make it easy. I, I am not familiar with those okay. off, well. off the cuff. Cool. So we've got a few more questions in. I also have some questions, but we'll ask um, our, our next question from, from Timothy uh, Glazer. How do current and future state mapping fit into the overall process? So, I mean, I think it's, it's a great question. I mean, when you're developing a roadmap that is quite broad and involves multiple projects, I think you can... Part of your vision is to look at what, what the future state is and where you want to get to. I think even for an individual project, really what I'm talking about when I talk about the vision is your future state. And current state would be the mapping you do of the existing process, for example, but also the work you do when you're delving into the various stakeholders and how they're affected by the current problem. So you would develop current state off the back of your interviews with current users and stakeholders and your process mapping. And I do think that it's useful to do that current state, future state, because it then allows you to do the trajectory. You know, what do you need to do in order to get there, which is part of the transitional requirements. What will be necessary to get from point A to point B? What What are you seeing now as an area where, you know, legal departments are looking more and more towards, you know, legal tech solutions? And like, how does it kind of start? It's a little bit of a, of a tough question. Uh, hopefully not a tough question, but like what I guess I'm just curious, like what what are you seeing now in that regard? You mean in terms of what what legal tech solutions people are investing in at the moment? Or, or like maybe not necessarily like individual names, but areas where you know legal departments are going. And I'm just curious to you know dig deeper into that topic and just talk about how the, these projects you know kind of unfolded and why. Irene, go ahead. Yeah, I think uh, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of a break as you've, you've carried <laughs> the light part of this uh, presentation. So I think there, there there's a number of areas that get a lot more attention. I think number one is CLM, contract lifecycle management. Uh, that's the focus of most companies at the moment. We also see a lot in the uh, in, in part of the of the life cycle, the contract life cycle. So a lot of focus on contracting, drafting and reviewing contract. Then there is um, still a need for legal hold software. There's a lot of interest in it, as we saw in our previous uh, session mm -hmm. in document management, keeping and, and storing files and making them searchable. Uh, I think those are the the four or five key areas for for in-house uh, departments um, and of course vendor management sorry if i if i make it a you know it's five i'd say vendor management um, uh, would be the fifth got it so so clm legal hold document management and vendor management I, maybe i missed one was there one I missed? I've CLM, legal hold, document management, and vendor management. Contracting, so document automation and solutions. Got it. Okay. And like from your experience, is it the legal department that's leading these initiatives or is it a business who's who's pushing it forward? Like, you know, what's yeah. the motivation? 
It, 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 it depends. I mean, ultimately, everything is a business problem. I think the need for document automation in contracting is, is driven by the business need to get the contracts done in a faster and more efficient way. Uh, contract management is, is a business decision ultimately, and it actually involves a number of different um, uh, segments of a business, including sales, procurement, legal, compliance, uh, and even finance. So that's a very all-encompassing legal hold is more uh, legal driven than some of the others um, in, in, in vendor management and then for legal that's mostly panel management. I think that's a combination of legal and procurement. So I'm looking at the, the chat. Thank you for that, Jeroen. I'm looking at the chat and the, like a few questions. So first, what is a legal hold? That's when there's a uh, litigation or there's potential litigation and the company has to be or the employees of the company have to be notified so that they don't inadvertently delete any, you know, material that might be relevant to the litigation. That's generally what a legal hold is. Gerardo is asking, do you have any specific approaches with open source technologies? I'm not sure how applicable that is, but you know, let me know what you think. I, I'm, a, I'm a big believer in open source technologies. Um, at a lot of companies, because of security protocols, there's some additional issues around using open source occasionally. It, often open source require a higher lift from a development perspective. So it would require additional resources. But if you find an open source technology that works and where the it's in compliance with the requirements internally around security, I'm, I'm a big believer in, in leveraging what you're able to, especially if you're under budgetary constraints when it comes to bringing in new solutions. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree 100%. It's a better answer than I would give. And uh, the only nuance I would bring to, the, to this is, um, uh, Nikki already alluded to it, is open source is, is a great potential resource for when you're building a solution but uh, i think both nikki and i are very much in agreement on the fact that before building a solution you should look at buying things that are off the shelf so if there's an open source technology that you can use off the shelf without having to spend effort on um, building it or customizing it, uh, by all means, go ahead. But for most other solutions, you can get away without um, having to devil build your custom solution. And I, I would just add one additional thing, which is probably preferable to open source is to look at some of the new apps that have been released around the Microsoft suite or around AWS. So there are a number of different larger organizations that are releasing apps that are quite powerful that may not necessarily require the organization to buy something new, um, but perhaps to expand a license elsewhere. So that may be, and Salesforce, exactly. Thank you, Dennis. <laughs> There was a good, there was a great comment in the chat by Amy, who says matter management and e-billing is another great area to look at for corporate legal departments. I wholeheartedly agree with that. Uh, thank you, Amy. So I guess if there's no other questions, um, why don't we do a final, you know, takeaway? Oh, I stand correctly. It looks like Gerardo is talking about, you know, open source opportunity or open source technologies and definitely try to uh, reach out to him if you're interested. Nikki and Yarun, would you like to make a, you know, or leave us with a final statement or, you know, something to look forward to? We talked about upcoming content um, ideas, so I'll give a little teaser there. So I'm excited to do events on each of these subjects with you guys, but I digress. Any any final, uh, any closing uh, comments or statements before we sign off for the day? I think, thank you for having us. It's It's, it's been great to be here. We'll be back again um, in in about a month where we talk about alternative ways to do legal research together with Trellis. That's going to be an exciting uh, uh, session where Nikki will not have to bear all the, all the work. We will divide it a bit more equally. But thank you uh, to everyone in the audience and to you, Shay. And thank if you. there's anything else that 
all of you who are still here and thank you for so many of you for staying for the Q&A. If there's anything that you're keen to hear about that is related to digital transformation and legal tech, please don't hesitate to send those through to Shai. He can pass them along and we'll do our best to develop content. Awesome, sounds good. So we will end it here. So thanks everybody for tuning in.